What's the difference between a violin and a fiddle? Well, most people say the only difference is in the violinist or the fiddler. In other words, it's how it's played. One thing that's the same for both is the importance of the bow. Now, this may just look like a stick, but you'll be amazed at the complexity, precision, and dedication required in building violin bows. We'll show you how it's done next on Handmade Music. If you think of a violin as a high-performance machine, then the bow is the fuel that powers it. Without the very best fuel, a violin can never reach its maximum potential. For a violinist, performing with a 19th century French bow can be a dream come true, but those bows command a king's ransom. Today on Handmade Music, we'll discover how modern craftsmen offer alternatives for the world's best musicians. Our lesson in bow making brings us to Mendocino, California, where Stephen Beckley creates bows of exceptional craftsmanship and beauty. Stephen's task is not unlike that of a symphony conductor. Both must interpret master works with great respect and understanding. Stephen makes each bow his own with a tip of the hat to the classics. If you try to um, come up with your own model without, um, you know, having any sense of history, it's like um, trying to trying to come up with your own style of ballet when you never took classical ballet. And it um, looks silly to those that, um, that did take classical ballet. <laughs> so. To show you how to build a bow, we'll focus on two of its components, the stick and the frog. First, let's look at the stick's construction. Sticks are made with Pernambuco wood. A bow must be dense, strong, elastic, light, and if that's not enough, beautifully grained and colored. That makes Pernambuco really the only choice. But don't expect to find it in your local lumber yard. In fact, with its South American habitat severely threatened, bow makers have become the tree's protectors. That role is something Stephen takes seriously, and his first step proves it. He marks out a bow blank from a template with great precision. Wasting material is considered a mortal sin among bow makers. Using a bandsaw, Stephen creates a blank before checking its quality. Wrapping the stick against his palm tells him plenty about the character of this wood. He's feeling for vibrations that indicate a stick's action. To judge wood, time and experience are the only forms of education a bowmaker receives. The transformation from blank to bow begins with the head. You can see here the many stages Stephen goes through to create a finished head. But stage one is simple enough. He marks a profile and cuts away a rough shape. Stephen picks this stage to attach the tip. The tip's job is to hold the horsetail hair to the head. Traditionally, tips were made from ivory, but incredibly, mastodon tusk has become the new standard. The mastodon hasn't been around for 10,000 years or so. Um, they still are um, finding it in during spring thaws up in, in the Arctic tundra. Stephen attaches the tip to the roughly carved head with glue. His clamping method sort of gives you an idea of the practical and independent nature of bow makers. Sometimes the simplest is still the best, and um, this way I'm able to um, apply pressure over a um, fairly large area. After the glue dries, the tip's placement proves helpful in carving the head. Not all bow makers put the tip on this early, but to me I find it really helpful to to have the point of reference of the tip. It really um, really tells you where everything is. You obviously now know the height of the head, you know the length of the head, you know where the bow, bow starts at. So it's, um, it's really nice to, to be able to have a, a solid point of reference like that. Clearly, the bandsaw only roughed out the head shape. Stephen will methodically transform its shape from rectangle to triangle to violin bow head. Several carving methods are on display during this stage. Files, scrapers, and knives gradually form a shapely head. Next, Stephen adds a mortise to the tip. This will eventually be the entry point into the head for the horsetail hair. The initial hole is drilled into the tip using a bow lathe for control. The advantages of it, um, when I first saw people using them, I thought they were just trying to be quaint and cute. Um, 
which of course is part of the appeal, but the cutting on this is extremely non-aggressive. Using a past work for its pattern, Stephen scribes the lines for the mortise. Eventually, a wedge will trap the horsetail hair into this mortise. The angles are cut with precision to make the fit absolutely perfect. Well, we've only just begun. I think you're beginning to see just how intricate this project can be, but don't fret. Help is on the way. Just go to DIYNetwork.com for in-depth explanations of Stephen's craft. Now, coming up, we'll begin bending the stick to form the familiar shape of a violin bow. Don't go away. Welcome back to Handmade Music, where we're discovering the secrets of violin bow making. Previously, Stephen Beckley cut from a quality piece of Pernambuco wood to create a stick blank. After carving the rough profile of the head and attaching the tip, he's ready to bend it. The stick's bend is called its camber, and every aspect of the bow's camber is controlled before bending by creating a predetermined taper or graduation. You can graduate sticks um, in a number of ways, and right now I'm seeing that my graduations are stacked up pretty, pretty tight. Um, what I want is um, kind of a logarithmic um, progression. That progression means Stephen will mark changes in thickness along the stick. He makes adjustments with a hand plane and checks constantly on his progress. At this stage, these are, these are looking pretty good, but I'm going to take a little bit more material off in here to get these kind of spaced so that from this one to this one and this one to this one gets progressively um, greater so that you have a nice even taper. So, so I'm going to go back in here and um, take a couple more plane passes. The square bow blank will eventually be circular, but the transformation happens in stages. Stage one requires Stephen to plane the blank into an octagon. With eight 45 degree facets, the task of creating a circle is simple. He just rounds the edges. But that stage will have to wait. In the short term, the stick remains an octagon. Ideally, before moving on, the head should share the stick's design. It too will be rounded in time and adding facets will aid in that task. Okay, Stephen, so it's time to carve facets into the head? Yes, um, we've already um, established the taking the stick from being square to octagonal. Now we're going to continue those facets down into the head area. We've already got the head, head profile cut, so now we're going to carry these facets down like this. Mm -hmm. As you can see on the finished bow, the, um, those facets will eventually be rounded off. This step is really about symmetry. Stephen wants a smooth flow, extending from the butt end of the stick, up over the head, and all the way to the end of the tip. When the stick and the head are evenly tapered and sporting an octagon shape, it's time for the stick to become a bow. In other words, it's time to put the camber into the stick. Camber is, um, is the bend that we put into the bow, and it's kind of a, a suspension, you know, like a leaf spring would be a suspension for a car. It, um, you're putting you put that suspension under tension th with the hair, and then the hair and the camber kind of ride against each other. The dry heat of an alcohol lamp is used to prepare the wood for bending. It provides a low temperature flame that penetrates inside the stick without damaging the exterior. When a specific area is warm enough, Stephen provides pressure to force the bend. What I'm trying to do is um, control the bend by, by heating it evenly and then putting some stress on the stick and and just letting it um, kind of take a natural bend due to the due to the stress so I think that a bow in some odd way does have somewhat of a natural bend to it and exactly what your bend is will is a it's kind of a partnership with what your graduations are so you have to kind of go back and forth and um, between your graduations and your camber to to get it to all come out even. Clearly, his technique demonstrates an intimate understanding of Pernambuco's character. Its camber must be created inch by inch. Bending is an ongoing process, so while Stephen continues to work the Pernambuco, we'll take a break. But when we come back, we'll see what a frog has to do with his violin bow. Don't go away, handmade music will return.
Welcome back to Handmade Music. I'm Jeff Wilson. It's time to talk frogs. And even though we're here in Mendocino, California, not far from Calaveras County, the frogs we're looking for are on the end of Stephen Beckley's violin bows. And these frogs serve the bow in a couple of ways. Okay, so Stephen, we're going to talk about the frog a little bit now. Um, you know, to a layman, it looks like it's a handle. Yeah, well it, well, it actually doesn't serve that function because you'd hold the stick more like this with your thumb just slightly resting up against the front of the frog. I see. But the, um, its primary purpose is to um, keep the hair off of the stick. The, um, this metal part here is called the ferrule. That was introduced in the um, late 1700s. And by putting a small wooden wedge underneath here, it flattens the hair out into a nice even ribbon. I see. Yeah, it flattens it out. I see. Okay. And um, then the other function is by turning the button here, it pulls the, um, the frog back along the rails of the stick and will tighten or, or loosen the tension on the hair. Explaining what a frog does is easy. Making one, well, that's another story. Several stages lead to a completed frog, and for Stephen, crafting all the pieces is most of the fun. You've got your silver underslide that's been glued in that rides along the stick. You've got the, um, the heel plates, and then we've got the, um, this is the pearl slide, which slides in in a slotted dovetail, and it's mainly decorative, but it covers up the, um, the hair as it travels down the hair trough and, um, and into the box. Then we also have the, um, the silver ferrule, which I mentioned. It fits onto the tongue of the frog. And then you've got the brass or the bronze eyelet, which um, threads into this hole here, and by doing that, you can adjust the tension of how, how tight or loosely the stick the frog is held onto the stick. Right, and I guess you, you've made this cutaway where you've actually sort of sanded away one side and, and, and cut a window into the stick to yeah. show us how it actually works. Hopefully this will make it more clear to you. You can see this, um, this bronze eyelet through the window here is, um, is threaded into the frog. And when you turn the button here, you can see the screw moving and the um, bronze eye travels along the screw. And right, it pulls the frog back with it. Yep. And um, it can also see the, um, the hair path here. As it comes in underneath the ferrule, you have this, this is the, um, this white section here is the wedge that presses it up against the ferrule. I see. Then the hair path comes down here and goes over this, um, this wedge, and here's the, where the hair has been tied off. And this wedge is put in and out um, every time you rehair the bow. The foundation of the frog is its ebony stock. It slowly transformed from a rectangle to a shapely trapezoid with hollowed sides. Creating the frog's throat begins by drilling a hole into the ebony with a bow lathe. From here we can um, cut down or chisel out and, and we've got the beginning of our throat. The D-shaped ferrule attached to the throat will hold the horsetail hair in place. Stephen creates the shape with two flat strips of silver. One piece remains flat, but not the other. So now I'm going to, to bend it. Like that. When he solders both pieces together, he has the shape he needs to fit the ferrule onto the frog. To make way for it, Stephen carves the end of the frog's throat. A tapered dovetail is needed to allow the pearl slide to slide. Its purpose is to cover and secure the horsetail hair after it passes through the ferrule. On the other side of the frog, Stephen creates a recess for the silver underslide. This is the contact point between the frog and stick. With all the troughs cut, Stephen adds the frog's hardware with glue and clamps it all together. There's more work to be done on the frog, and when we come back, we'll finish it and the rest of the work on the stick. Don't go away. Handmade Music will be right back. Welcome back to DIY's Handmade Music. Today, Stephen Beckley is showing us how to build a violin bow. Stephen, we, uh, we talked about the frog earlier and uh, how it works with the button to put tension on, uh, on the bow. But now I'd like to talk about the button itself. I understand they're commercially available, finished, but uh, you actually build your own. Yes, most, um, most top-end bow makers do make their own. It allows you to um, choose some of your aesthetics in terms of your proportions of the silver to the ebony, mm -hmm. um, the way that you carve you know, hand turn this lip here. And um, in this case, you can see that I've slightly flared the button from the back, mm. 
from the front to the back. Sort of your signature in a way. Correct. Mm -hmm. And then it's got the pearl eye in the yeah, end. Yeah, and then it's got the pearl eye at the end, and you can see that this back ring has actually been pounded octagonal as opposed to just being filed. And I, I like that look of having the octagonal um, frame Interior. around. Right, right, I see. Well, I've got all the parts right here. Um, you start with a block of ebony. Yeah, basically ebony. it's just a, a block of ebony, and then we turn it on the um, in the lathe. And next you see that we've got it turned down. We've got the two steps cut here to accept the silver rings. And we've also got the hole drilled down the center here to accept the screw and also a recess for the pearl eye. And then we also have the um, two rings here. This, is, this round one is for the front ring where I'll be cutting the lip over here. And then this back one is I pound octagonal because I like the look of, of the octagonal frame around the round pearl eye. When the intricate work is completed, Stephen marries the stick and the frog with a turn of the button. Okay, so the frog is sliding and moving fairly well up and down the stick, so <clears throat> we're, um, we're happy with that. Now with the button in place, Stephen can add the hair. It comes from the tail of a horse. He inserts one end of a strand into the tip through the mortise. A perfectly fit tip plug wedges that end in place. You can see the path of the hair as it travels over the top, goes behind the wooden wedge here and then down to where the, um, the hair is tied off with a knot. And this white piece of wood here is the replaceable wedge that you put in every time you, you rehair the bow and keeps the hair in place. At the other end, the horsetail hair tucks into the frog between the ebony and the pearl slide. And with the turn of the button, Stephen has tension on his bow. The bow reacts to the tension and changes the characteristics Stephen was just getting used to. But in a way only a craftsman can, he coaxes the bow back into shape. I think that's one, one argument for, for the finest bow still being made by hand, is that you're removing the wood kind of a thousandth of an inch at a time with a, with a hand plane. And as you do that, you can, you can check the bow and see what's happening to it and see if you need to take a little bit more off the west side or the east side. So Stephen, what final adjustments would you make? Well, the, the final thing I would do is I would put some tension on the bow once it's finished, mm -hmm. and then I would sight down it and make sure that the camber is nice and even and smooth. And if there was any spot that wasn't, that was slightly flat or, or needed, needed to have a little less curve, I would put it back into the flame and, um, and correct that. Okay. Even though the wood has experienced a good bit of trauma to get it to this point, Stephen wants the stick to think this was all its idea. In other words, it needs a very natural bend. Finally, you'll see there was a method to Stephen's madness when he shapes the bow into a circle. Up until now, the stick has been shaped with eight 45 degree facets, or an octagon. But now with the plane, Stephen simply removes the corner of each facet to create a round stick. I'll scrape it some, I'll give it some filing, and then eventually I'll just wrap some sandpaper around it and um, work it up and down and, um, and knock, knock some more things off that way. The facets on the head are rounded as well, but there's still the issue of finish. In spite of Pernambuco's deep rich color, most bow makers enhance it just a bit. We generally enhance the, the color by, by sunning it for a while. It, um, it's a fairly photoreactive wood, and so it, um, it usually darkens up fairly nicely. When Stephen's satisfied with the color, French polishing ensues. This finishing technique has served bow makers well for a couple of centuries, so it's hard to argue against it. And finally, the bow receives one last touch. Now, Stephen, uh, wrapping looks fairly straightforward. You've wrapped this bow with a silver wire. Uh, what does that accomplish? Well, there's a couple of reasons to put a wrap on a bow. Of course, the first one is just to simply protect the stick from the grip of the player. But also, there's a number of materials that you can use to wrap a bow, and that gives you a fine tuning on the weights and balances of a bow. Oh, I see. This is a 10,000 silver wrap that's, um, that adds about 4.5 grams to the bow. I could have also used this um, silver tinsel, which would have only added about 2 grams to the bow. With the wrap complete, there's a final test of the bow. It comes from guys like Jeremy Coons, a musician who knows the value of a great bow. If you'd like to learn more about the challenge of bow making, visit our website at DIYNetwork.com. You'll soon find out how difficult it can be to build a stick. As a point of reference, when we built a banjo on Handmade Music, it took our luthier Dave Ball about 40 total hours to complete the project. 
Believe it or not, this stick took just as much time. There are fewer parts, but just as much dedication and appreciation for the craft. Well, Stephen, it is beautiful, and uh, as we've seen in the right hands, it's, it's functional, too. Well, thank you very much for coming by. Until next time, thanks for watching Handmade Music. <laughs>